we want to have robots learning motion. Um, in case you have, uh, so I will uh, stop some at some point maybe for questions, but uh, in case you have a question, uh, you can feel free to uh, write in the chat. Uh, I have a question and then uh, as soon as I see it, uh, I will try to, well, I, I will give you boys or you can write a question in the chat uh, as you prefer. Okay, so uh, I think I will get started. Um, so I think uh, everyone can see the screen. Okay. So um, let me talk a little bit about motiv the motivation between learning uh, robot motion and particularly in human environments. So when we want these uh, robots to learn to do things uh, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a setting that involves human invo or involves uh, fragile things or uh, let's say uh, out of the cage, uh, we want uh, several things to happen and to be uh, coded in the robot. Uh, one of them is that uh, programming, programming in the robot is easy. Um, but tip, what, what we usually say is that uh, our grandmas should be able to program a robot. So basically that's uh, kind of the idea behind having a, a friendly programming. Uh, also, uh, when we want the robots to uh, learn uh, from it, uh, we need uh, the robots to encode uh, in an efficient manner this uh, this motion that we teach them, and uh, this uh, this has some uh, implications, uh, especially considering the dimensionality of these uh, motion representations, and they are also uh, linked uh, to what uh, we call the sample efficiency. So um, sample efficiency meaning that uh, we don't usually have, with real robots we don't usually have many samples uh, for demo for teaching the robot we don't uh, spend the whole day teaching a robot uh, to uh, grasp an object uh, and the robot also doesn't have many uh, many um, many uh, samples uh, for improving uh, its behavior so ideally we want the robot not only to imitate a human but then uh be, be capable of uh performing better and better through experience uh, this also involves uh, when you go to the real environments to uh, be able to adapt to any changing environment this means that if we teach the robot um, any kind of task like feeding a person and the person actually moves to the right, to the right or to the left um, then uh, the robot needs to adapt to this uh, changing situation uh, of, of, the, of the person and also uh, we, when the robot interacts with someone or with something that is not very rigid we need it to uh, to be safe safe in the in, in the in control terms and uh, this uh, is called uh, what we call this compliant control it means that when the robot uh, the robot should avoid colliding with people but if it collides with people it collides uh, in a compliant manner so it doesn't hurt the person so it's a soft uh, impact, let's say. And moving on, uh, a little bit of overview of the things that I will talk about uh, in, during this presentation. So first of all, uh, if we want the robots to move, we have to talk a little bit about kinematics and control because uh, this is what uh, makes the robot move. And then I will very fast to talk about forward and inverse kinematics, uh, robot configurations and uh, control. And then about robot motion learning, I will talk about motion characterization, policy representation improve, and policy improvements, and also about uh, multimodal problems, uh, other things like dimensionality, um, also adaptability to changing environments and uh, compliant, this compliant control. Also, remind, uh, as I said, I want to, to remind you that, uh, as I said before, uh, we are talking about uh, having few samples. This means that uh, it is very hard to implement some methodologies that are uh, state-of-the-art over the last years, like uh, neural networks. Uh, in some uh, robotic applications, uh, it is very hard to implement uh, neural networks because they require a, a large amount of data usually. So. Uh, in robot, in robot motion control in real environments, uh, these uh, deep learning techniques are, are, are used, but are used, for example, for getting uh, vision feedback or getting uh, other uh, like uh, dynamic modeling, uh, etc. But for learning the task itself, as we have, uh, we don't have many, uh, much more 
much information, uh, we don't usually use this uh, that kind of methods. Uh, we call we call this uh, small data uh, small data uh, instead of with, in contrast with the big data approaches. So starting a little bit about kinematics and control, uh, probably everyone knows that um, what's uh, so basically we have here a redundant robot. So it's a, it has seven joints. It's an anthropomorphic arm, so it's its uh, structure is similar to to that of the human, and uh, it has seven seven joints, and it can uh, we can control the end effector pose, uh, which is uh, six dimensional because it has uh, three degrees of freedom of position and three of orientation. And uh, it, there's, uh, there's, we know that this, there's two, uh, these two mappings, one that goes from the joint space to the Cartesian space of, or the end effector pose. And it's a forward kinematic. The forward kinematics is usually easy uh, to to, to, to compute. Uh, it's basically uh, in serial robots, uh, it's basically you can use, uh, for example, the dynamic Hartenberg parameters and build uh, the homogeneous transformations matrices for each link uh, or each joint, and then uh, do the product of them and you get the Cartesian pose. Okay. But the problem comes uh, when you want to do the inverse kinematics. So basically, you have the end, of, end effectors pose. And you want a uh, certain vector of joints that uh, puts the end effector uh, robot in that position and orientation. The thing here is that um, having uh, such a redundant robot, uh, first of all, if we have a mapping from a space of dimension seven to space of dimension six, when you do the inverse, you will have uh, you will probably have infinite many solutions. So. Uh, if you want to do like an analytical method of this, uh, so mapping the joints to the to the Cartesian vector, doing this inverse matrix. Uh, so here x is the generalized Cartesian pose and q is the joint uh, the joint state. Uh, so doing this inverse uh, is not easy because you you, you would need to represent a, a whole manifold of uh, in this case one dimension uh, with one parameter, for example, and uh, while there. I, exact solutions they are usually ad hoc for each robot you have to build and derivate it in case you can actually solve it and uh, of course that's infinite solutions uh, so basically there's many other methods uh, a, a typical method for solving the schematics are called the jacobian based methods uh, and the take advantage of the fact that uh, you can map the joint velocities into the Cartesian space velocities through the, through the Jacobian of the, of the manipulator that is easy to, to compute. So basically this uh, means that uh, you can map uh, an error on the Cartesian space into a, into a gain into, in, the, in the joint space by inverting the Jacobian matrix. And here I write this star instead of an inverse because the Jacobian matrix is not uh, it's not a square matrix for redundant robots. So basically you have to do all kinds of inverse like uh, so the inverse. These are probably most of you already know. Uh, this kind of solutions are general but are approximate and uh, of course if the Jacobian becomes ill-conditioned at some point uh, doing this inverse is very problematic because then you get uh, very high gains uh, on the on, the, on inverting the Jacobian, and then you get uh, delta Qs that are very large, because we have to uh, have to remind you that uh, this uh, this Jacobian is a uh, is a local approximation. So basically, the larger the error, the worse this Jacobian approximation works. There are many other methods for solving the inverse kinematics: uh, neural networks, quadratic programming, many machine learning applications, etc. But uh, usually the first attempts are at the robot are uh, like analytical methods and Jacobian based. Jacobian based methods, uh, the initial, uh, the, the early applications were using the Jacobian transpose, uh, which is, which converges to the same solution, uh, or the pseudo inverse, which is, uh, can be computed easily with the singular value decomposition. And if the Jacobian can be expressed as the sum of, uh, of the singular values uh, with these uh, eigenvectors, uh, then they so so the inverse just inverting the singular value. So as you can as you can see here, there is one inverse uh, one divided by sigma i. This means that if one singular value becomes zero or close to zero, then this uh, grows uh, very very rapidly. Um, 
So basically there are methods like damped, damped cell inverse, which uh, substitutes this one divided by sigma for sigma divided by sigma square plus some regularization term. This actually works better, but there's uh, also this, um, you have to tune this lambda because if you put the lambda too large, then you uh, you kind of lose information. And if you put it too small, then you don't, do not dampen enough and you still have the same problem. So um, this dumping can be constant or it can depend on uh, smaller, smaller uh, sigma, also can depend on the current error, etc. You can also dump, uh, limit the gains on each uh, singular of, uh, of each agent back to direction. Okay, um, also you can weight the outputs uh, uh, depending on the joins and you can add rows to the Jacobian array corresponding to gradients of uh, potential functions that you choose. Also, uh, you can project uh, potential functions to the kernel of the Jacobian because I remind, I remind you that the Jacobian has one redundant degree of freedom. So you can, uh, the kernel of the Jacobian matrix is, has dimension one in the, in the case of the, of the row that I showed you. So you can, compute a gradient of a certain function you want to optimize. For example, I want the elbow to be uh, as up as possible. So you put that as a potential function and you put it here and it's uh, treated as a, uh, as a secondary objective. Uh, with this idea, you can concatenate several, um, several uh, secondary objectives over one another. But when choosing this task hierarchies, uh, what I, what my experience told me was that always, 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 I know you we want to have the robot moving to some position, but always uh, safety comes first. So when computing kinematics, when controlling a robot, safety will come first. So in this case, for example, we first uh, want the robot to not uh, go farther away than the joint limits that it has. Because if we send that command, the, the vote will encounter a, a limitation. And if we don't have a like, proper control uh, limit, limits, then it might burn the, the motor. And then uh, we can put limitations like going to the desired position, avoiding singularities, uh, proximity to a reference, or any other. To give you more uh, examples of uh, how important the kinematics uh, that we, we use uh, is, uh, I will show you this video, which is like horrible resolution, but uh, it will make the point, I think. And here you imagine um, we are moving a robot to, uh, through a trajectory. And in this trajectory, uh, we have a first joint uh, on the on the x uh, ax, axis and the other joints uh, on the vertical axis. So basically these are the all the possible solutions of the of these of the one robot, which is seven degrees of freedom, uh, so one redundant degree of freedom. So all the possible solutions for all the joints are put here, and we will, what we will see is that sometimes uh, there are like regions with different solutions that correspond. For example, like what the the elbow from this side or the elbow for the uh, in the other side, and they are. Um, they are both valid solutions, but there's a large difference between them. And what happens is that sometimes these solutions are uh, connected, but sometimes they disconnect. And when they disconnect, one of these solutions might drift away towards the joint limits and eventually disappear. And if we are using that solution, then suddenly the robot will not be able to go on with the trajectory. So let me show you how this evolves. So basically now it has a speed, some solutions disappeared. Here on the left, now it disappears. And now it will, uh, some new solutions will appear again. So basically, uh, when you do like trajectories and you use uh, things like inverse kinematics, you have to be aware of this. Because if you don't plan, uh, have a planner, you have to be aware of these situations. Because then if, the, so if your solution disappears from the feasible solution set, suddenly the robot will want to go towards, uh, imagine the, the middle column solutions. And this will represent a big jump in the joint space of the robot. So basically the robot will make either make a very fast move or uh, just like have a, like one of these emergency stops. And this is something you do not want when you are working uh, in human environments. Um, also when you have uh, this, um, 
is kinematics characterized, you, it is also interesting to always consider the uh, arm configuration. So basically, if you have two arms fold, folding clothes, uh, like in these two examples, uh, these are both uh, very famous videos, um, putting the two arms in a position that uh, is like useful for you, both your task uh, and, and, and applications, and all applications is very important because uh, otherwise you might, uh, you might end up trying to do things that the robot cannot uh, do well in, the, in how you place them. For example, in the PR2, the, the both arms are placed in a human, humanoid fashion. In the, in the, right, uh, in the right video, the arms are placed in a position that I don't know if it's uh, it has been studied. I didn't see a, a paper of, about it, but I think that it's probably because of because they are very heavy arms, and uh, this is one of the solutions they found, so that the arm the, the, the base can hold this weight. Because if they would mount them uh, in, in the side on the side, then probably they would have structural problems. So. Um, to do that, we, we have been studying sometimes. Uh, some we, we studied some time ago this thing. We uh, studied so things like uh, the ori orientation solutions, manipulability, conditioning of the Jacobian joint limits, and solution density of the index kinematics for different kind of ki kinds of configuration of the of arms. And we could um, do some kind of optimization to see uh, under certain restrictions, which were which is a good uh, positioning of two arms for certain tasks. So this is something you will always need to consider. And then we move on to uh, control. So as I said, uh, safety in human robot uh, interaction is crucial. Uh, so uh, some, uh, it is very common to use the uh, impedance control or ambulance control because uh, robots have uh, are very strong and dangerous. Here uh, we lowered a little bit the control uh, gains of the, of the robot, but still were uh, rigid, in, uh, rigid enough. So you can see that it has some backlash. So if the robot is very rigid and you push it or you uh, stop it, then when you release it, uh, it will probably have a backlash and might hurt you. And Moreover, if the robot is moving fast, which is sometimes the case, then it can hit someone and be really harmful. So it's not only the, the inertia that it brings, uh, but also the, 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 the force that it's carrying and the force that it's applying while there is uh, an impact or interaction. So uh, what, we are, what we usually used was a fit forward controller. So basically when we have a, when we build the controller, we have our desired trajectory and we uh, are comparing the, the robot uh, state, we build a controller and this controller action is sent to the robot. Also, there can be external forces that are acting on the robot. And in the case of the fit forward control, what we do is that uh, the controller torque that we send to the robot is a inverse dynamic model of the robot plus a PID compensator. So this inverse dynamic model is an approximation of the dynamics uh, of the robot. So the idea is that if we have a position and velocity and acceleration that we want uh, to have, so we compute the forces that uh, will be uh, acting on the robot for that trajectory. So basically it's uh, just enough uh, forces that are needed for following the trajectory. But of course this will have um, an error. Uh, so the model will have an error, so we have to compensate this error, and not only this error, but the external forces that might, that might occur. And to do that, let me show you a little bit um, the dynamics equation of a, of a robot. Uh, so this is the robot dynamics equation. Probably many of you have also uh, seen this equation. Here we have, for example, the inertia matrix, the gravity, uh, the control action, these ones are easy, easy to obtain. So in the inertia matrix, you can uh, is usually provided by the manufacturer. The gravity is also uh, easy to compute. The controller, uh, usually we usually send um, current signals, but we can rely. We usually rely, can rely on uh, what uh, the conversion to this from this current to the torques is. But on the other hand, we have these uh, Coriolis and tripetal forces that are a little bit more harder to model and depend uh, on many uh, many uh, parameters of the of the dynamics of the robot uh, and also the friction. These are harder to model, especially the friction, which is a complete black box. Uh, so 
Um, I haven't seen many rob. I think I haven't seen any robot that is sold with a code for uh, characterizing a friction. And friction usually is a very relevant term you know, when you are moving a robot. So basically, uh, if you are not moving at very high speed uh, with these anthropomorphic arms, the most, uh, the most, uh, so the largest term is usually gravity, and then it's usually friction. So if you increase velocity, then the Coriolis and Inertias start taking, uh, the, uh, gaining uh, value. But uh, friction is usually the most, most. Uh, important term after gravity. Uh, also, uh, we have to take into account that uh, if we are working with a robot with uh, just uh, position encoders, uh, then this acceleration might be obtained by derivating twice the position. And uh, this is very dangerous, so we have to be careful with these uh, kind of signals because if we have a sampling time of one millisecond. Uh, when we derivate the position, any error that we have in the position encoder, we will multiply it by, by 1,000. And if we derivate twice, then this error will be multiplied by one million. So basically, we will, uh, this uh, small error that we have in the position encoder will become a huge noise that uh, completely occludes uh, our real, real signal of acceleration. And also we have uh, an external force that can be also expressed as the Jacobian transposed times the force the force that is applied on the end effect of the robot. So uh, these uh, controllers that I was mentioning, uh, if, we, if we model the dynamics of the robot, we can also estimate uh, contact forces which, which are without the need of, uh, of a torque sensor. So we can field a lot of uh, the signals and building this, the inverse dynamic model and the state observer, we can uh, do a force estimation, which would be, uh, if, we, if we go back, this force estimation roughly would be similar to this PID compensator. So basically, if we look at this, at this equation again, uh, this UC here would be a model on the, uh, of the left side of the equation plus a PID controller. So if we put uh, all these models on the other side, we, have, we would have modeling error uh, equals the PID controller minus external forces. So basically the control action that we are applying uh, means that uh, the PID action that we are applying is the model error plus the external force. So we are basically compensating for the model error and its external forces. And if we know that there are no external forces, then we will be uh, having a model error. But if we know that um, our model is good enough, then we will be having a, a way of measuring external forces. Uh, so as an example here, uh, in this video, we had a acceptable uh, image dynamic model. So we can see that when you, we push a robot, uh, you can actually detect that something is happening and the direction in which it is happening. So again, this is just with a position encoder and controlling and building a model of the dynamics. So no, no, there's not always a need for um, for a torque sensor or force sensor. Okay. Uh, this was also used for um, knowing uh, how many, for example, when, pick, uh, when picking up clothes, how we can use it for like segregate how many garments of clothes that you can pick or any other applications. And uh, when you have uh, this uh, inverse dynamic model, what you can do is that if your model is good enough, or even if it's like decent or acceptable, you can actually lower the gains of the PID controller and you will still be able to more or less track the trajectory that you want. And when you do that, uh, when you lower the PID gains, and then what happens is that you actually end up with a compliant controller. And so the robot is, uh, is moving uh, soft, in a softer manner. So here on, on the left, we'll, uh, we'll see um, uh, Seiji, who is teaching the robot to put the scarf around the mannequin's neck. And then the robot is uh, encoding this and reproducing it. And on the right, we'll see uh, how this is, uh, this is done in a human. So using this kind of controls allows us, for example, to interact with a human 
uh, with the robot sorry and uh, you can see that it feels like a safer feeling and so far we have tested this uh, hundreds of times and nobody got hurt yet okay so but okay now that i've talked a little bit about kinematics and control which are uh, things that we always need to consider when we are moving robots. Now let's talk about uh, robot motion learning. And to start talking about robot motion learning, we need to talk a little bit about reinforcement learning. And classical reinforcement learning uh, usually, uh, usually uh, so you usually have like this Markov decision process, you have some states, some actions, and um, the thing is that uh, this, the action space uh, can sometimes uh, is, is often like uh, the discrete space, same as the, the state space. So uh, when we are in a robot, the state space, which is the joint configuration or the opposite of the robot is, uh, is continuous. And so is the, uh, the action space, which are the motor commands, acceleration commands, etc. So our policy uh, needs to, uh, is, cannot be devised uh, by saying, okay, in this state, I take this action. So uh, it's not just a basic rule. Actually, uh, uh, policies now can be stochastic, meaning that uh, they are probability distribution of applying a certain uh, actions, U uh, or torques or, or acceleration commands, given the state of the robot or deterministic, so just a function of the state. And then uh, usually there is the, the transition probability, which is the distribution of when we have the robot at a certain state and we apply certain action, we move to a new state, and a whole set, uh, a whole set of uh, states and actions is a trajectory rollout or path. And also uh, in reinforcement learning, uh, there's uh, the reward function. Uh, the reward function can be uh, many things. Uh, it's usually, for example, a terminal reward and some time step reward. Terminal reward would be like a task, a task achievement uh, indicator. And the time step reward would be like, I don't want large accelerations. I want to apply a large torques to the robot. I don't want the robot to be this close to this place. Uh, anything can be in here. Uh, I have to. I also need to mention one thing that there is a complete field about uh, inverse reinforcement learning, which is about uh, learning these reward functions. So these reward functions, in many cases, are um, handcrafted, let's say. And when you build them from scratch, there's always this risk that the robot ends up doing something that you didn't expect, because it is somehow exploiting something that you did wrong in the reward function. So this is something that you always need to, to be aware of. Mm -hmm. So when we uh, do this uh, reinforcement learning for a robot control, we then uh, treat the problem as an optimization problem. So basically what we want to uh, maximize is, the, is this J pi here, which is the expected value of the reward given the policy. So basically, basically we want to find the policy that maximizes the expected reward of using that policy. And this uh, presents uh, some difficulties. So basically the high dimensional, it's some, sometimes the parameter, the, the space in which we are searching for a solution is very high dimensional and it's continuous. Uh, and so there are things that we cannot do. And also we have real time requirements. We cannot do like very large computation for the policy at every time step. And um, experimentation is uh, costly. So moving robots uh, implies time um, and effort. And so it's not uh, that we can like move the robot 10,000 times. Uh, so we cannot usually use this value function before reinforcement learning that was used uh, in, in discrete space and discrete uh, search uh, some years ago. And uh, one uh, very common approach is to use uh, uh, motion characterizations such as movement primitives. Uh, there's many other approaches that uh, representing motions and policies, but the idea here is that we will do a parameterization of motion, and this parameterization of motion, uh, the, param the parameters themselves will be the policy. And we'll build a probab uh, probability distribution over these parameters that are of the of the robot uh, uh, of the robot motion parameterization, 
And this probability distribution will be our policy and it will be what we will optimize so that the robot behaves better. And I will start talking a little bit, uh, I will talk about uh, two kinds of movement primitives. The first one is uh, dy uh, dynamic movement primitives. Uh, also probably some, many of you have uh, heard about. And uh, dynamic movement primitives uh, consider the trajectories as uh, that, so basically the des desired acceleration is um, a, a second, so the desired trajectory is considered as a second order dynamical system. Basically we have a goal attractor and we have a critically damped uh, second order system uh, going towards this goal. But we have also have this at, uh, f of x, uh, which is uh, a time transformation, uh, x is a what, time tra transformation in this case. But what this f is doing is that she's shaping the trajectory. So we have the term, the goal attractor that is just going straight to the, well, not straight, but uh, um, directly to the goal. And then we have um, this shaping function that will give the trajectory the shape that we want. And this f of, uh, of x is, uh, is the product of some kernel uh, functions, which are often uh, Gaussian kernels, times this parameter vector. And these parameters are the parameters that are our policy. So this is the parameters that we will optimize and we will build the probability distribution of these parameters and uh, we'll work with that. Note that the kernels for the, the dynamic movement primitives include this x of t uh, multiplying on the, on, the, on the kernels because uh, this x of t is a decay term uh, that makes it so that uh, the robot, uh, so that the, they ensure that uh, the robot reaches the, the final goal. So basically the, the effect of this f of x uh, decreases over time. Um, to give you an idea of how these weights are, are working, so imagine you have these um, kernel functions on the upper plot, and so the at, uh, you have like a value you want to fit. So basically, um, you fit the you find the weights uh, multiplying the uh, the the activators, the activation uh, kernels, so that you fit the proper uh, profile of the trajectory. Um, dynamic movement primitives have uh, several advantages. Uh, it, they are compact representation of motion and they have good scalability properties uh, so that you can change the goal and the robot will adapt to the, to the new goal uh, very easily. Uh, the parameters are quite intuitive uh, in the way that if you increase uh, one parameter which corresponds to the uh, the third kernel of the second joint, you know that the second joint will have more acceleration uh, during that period of time that, uh, that, the, that the kernel influences. And uh, it is a parameterized policy for reinforcement learning algorithms and it is linear. Uh, so the acceleration is linear with respect to, this, uh, to these parameters. However, uh, when you do this uh, rescalation, uh, there can be some similarities if the initial position and the goal is uh, are very, are very similar. Also, uh, assigning the value point to the dynamic movement primitives is complicated sometimes. And also, uh, I was talking before about uh, noisy acceleration. So when you have noise acceleration, you have to be careful when fitting uh, dynamic movement primitives because the noise can affect you a lot and then you have to put regularization terms and if you put regularization terms you lose information. Okay so now moving on to uh, probabilistic movement primitives uh, which are other another uh, movement primitive uh, type. Um, so imagine you have uh, several trajectories which are uh, here in gray and um, you teach them, you teach these trajectories to a robot, and then for every time step, you have what's the mean and variance of the trajectory. So basically, a probabilistic movement primitive want to capture this variance uh, well and use uh, and, and use it. Uh, so the approximation now is very similar to the, the dynamic movement primitives, and so that you have, you can use the position or the position and uh, velocity of the joints or the, of the, or the Cartesian, uh, the Cartesian pose. And it's also a, the product of uh, some basis function times uh, weight vector, plus some system noise, and the, which is uh, this noise is uh, the, the, the error on the encoders, but also the error in fitting these parameters. So basically these weights, then you, um, 
uh, then you can have um, so you basically you can compute uh, this weight vector for every trajectory that you teach uh, before. So here, every trajectory, for every trajectory you compute with the same kernels, uh, you compute this uh, omega uh, k, let's say k for every trajectory, and then or, or this omega you know, one, omega two, omega n with number of trajectories, you can build a probability distribution with a mean and covariance. And the good thing here is that this probability distribution over the weights is actually mapped, can be actually mapped into the probability distribution of the state of robots. So basically, uh, with the kernels and the probability distribution of the weights, you can recover all this information. And this also has uh, other advantages. So you build the trajectory at the position and velocity uh, or velocity level, which is better than building at the acceleration level, which is noisy. And you can ha use uh, all the probability operations on, on, the, on the distribution, like conditioning to a buy point. You can uh, make the product of different trajectories, uh, which end up uh, on uh, merging these trajectories. You can uh, shift from one to another. It's uh, like there's a lot of uh, operations that you can do with them. And also uh, in the original paper, uh, they present a model-based stochastic controller. The thing is that this uh, stochastic controller has some numerical stability issues, but uh, can be can be applied to work well. And what, this, what it does is that um, at every time step, it's uh, it's trying to match the variance uh, of the of the distribution that you have with the with the gains that uh, that you need. Uh, another thing you need with probabilistic movement print is that the, you require uh, several time aligned uh, time aligned demonstrations to to feed it. So basically, you have if you have several demonstrations, you have to align them in time um, in in order to to feed the motion. So um, again, uh, so I've, I've talked a little bit about DMPs and probabilities a bit. Uh, you can find a lot of literature about uh, about both, uh, and also a lot of extensions. And uh, some of them are very useful. Some of them are, uh, are maybe very ad hoc ad hoc uh, implementations. But you can check uh, about them. And once we have uh, the motion characterized or parameterized with functional, which is like movement primitive in this case, uh, we can uh, talk about policy search or reinforcement learning of, of robot motion. Uh, so imagine you have some demonstration or demonstration this is a continuous motion, and then we parameterize it with movement primitives. And then we, we generate samples. Uh, so in the case of the probabilistic movement primitives, you can see that so you have this P of the omega equals normal. So we can uh, normal of uh, omega given mu uh, omega sigma omega. So you can generate samples from this distribution and you can execute them on the robot. So basically you generate new trajectories within this distribution. And then what you can do is uh, after every sample that you generate, you uh, evaluate uh, this trajectory with uh, so you, you explore uh, the sh uh, on, on the parameter space and then for every sample you evaluate uh, the trajectory and when you have some uh, trajectories uh, you can use some policy search algorithm some reinforcement learning algorithm to reevaluate the policy so restrict the policy uh, to uh, to an area where the robot is behaving better. So um, imagine you teach a robot to throw something, uh, to, to throw a paper on the, to the garbage bin. So initially you, sh you show a couple of times and then the robot has tried, has starts rehearsing, rehearsing. And uh, every time the robot rehearses, you tell him, okay, uh, that was close, that was far away, that was like uh, in, the, in the bin. And so from that, the robot ends up uh, optimizing uh, its parameters. And there's different way, uh, ways in general terms of uh, doing this policy search uh, methods. One of them would be like use policy gradients. And in policy gradients, you basically uh, generate some samples and you see how much, uh, so you basically you want to infer um, the 
the gradient of this uh, j, which was the expected reward. So uh, we want to maximize the expected reward. So uh, through samples, we approximate this uh, policy gradient and we update our parameters with that pol uh, our policy with that uh, policy gradient that can be estimated in different ways. Also, there are expectation maximization uh, methods uh, in which uh, the learning problem is converted into a, a statistical inference problem and uh, also information theoretic approaches. Um, this is uh, this has been a little bit more popular uh, over the last years. And uh, when we talk about information theoretic approaches, uh, we talk about uh, staying uh, close to known data, um, not losing uh, information about that we have, because as I said, uh, data is very valuable and we should, we mustn't lose um, we mustn't lose information when we have a, a, a reduced amount of samples. So one example of these methods is a relative entropy policy search, uh, which is very used uh, nowadays and has been used over the last decade. And basically what they do is to maximize the expected reward. So nothing new here. And the third row is like that the policy is a public distribution. But the second row here is that is the Kullback library divergence bound. And so what is that? So basically, the Kullback library divergence between two probability distribution is a non-symmetrical uh, indicator. So basically, if we switch the order of these two terms, the, the value will be different. But it indicates how different two probability distributions are. And what this is telling us is that, so this Q of theta is the current policy and this pi of theta is the new policy. So what we are seeing here is that we want the new policy not to be far away uh, from uh, the current policy. So up to a threshold epsilon that we can set. So basically we want to stay close to the known data because we don't want the robot to be too greedy. We don't want the robot to do like uh, things that we do not know what will happen because uh, the unknown in real robot execution sometimes is dangerous. So uh, with, this, with this restriction, we can actually uh, solve the problem and be more conservative. And now uh, I will show you a little bit how this is solved. I think it's interesting that once in a lifetime you see it. Um, so basically, uh, what happens here is that we want uh, to solve this problem, and uh, what what is often well, what is often done in this kind of uh, solving this problem is that we build the Lagrangian of the problem, and then uh, we derivate with respect to the policy. So we are looking for the policy that maximizes this uh, the expected world. So we derivate with respect to the policy and set it to zero. And setting it to zero, uh, we can use this z equals the exponential of, uh, this, uh, um, of these parameters, which are the Lagrangian multipliers. And we can isolate the policy uh, from this, uh, uh, from the previous row. So basically what we get here is that the policy is a, is a constant times the, uh, the current policy times exponential of the reward divided by one of the Lagrange multipliers. So basically the solution is proportional to the, uh, to the current policy weighted with the exponential of the reward divided by this Lagrange multiplier. And this is very interesting, uh, uh, very interesting uh, property, which uh, will be used later. So we can then express that, uh, so one is the, so the probability distribution of the policy adds up to one and we substitute the policy here and then we multiply by z and we can insert the policy that we obtained into the Lagrangian and then suddenly we obtain this dual function. So basically we did a lot of algebraic manipulation and we end up uh, finding this uh, dual function solution and we can uh, optimize this function and find the, uh, the eta parameter that is the Lagrange multiplier. And with this Lagrange multiplier, we can, we can actually uh, update the policy. So basically, we can also discretize this. So as this Q here is, um, 
So it's the current policy that we have sampled this current, the, the Q. So basically you can substitute the, the integral over Q for a sum over the values of Q. And so this ends up being something like this. And um, basically here, we, what, we can, what we see here, we can solve this, we optimize this for uh, finding eta. And as, uh, as, as, as we know from, so the solution has a flat form. So the solution will be the sum of the samples time uh, weighted for by, by this term, which is the exponential of the reward of every sample divided by this eta that we just found. And um, basically, <clears throat> sorry. and basically, uh, we call this exponential uh, of reward divided by eta, so pk. And so we have we have some policy parameters omega that are following a normal distribution, uh, normal which is uh, mu omega sigma omega. Then the new policy is just a weighted mean and weighted covariance of these uh, samples that we generated. So omega k is a, is the kth sample, and dk is the is that the, is the weight that we obtain after uh, applying Z and obtaining this eta, then we obtain these decays, and then uh, we can generate a new mean, new covariance. Here, you can also use the unbiased weighted estimation, uh, which is probably better. So if you want to know what it is, what it is I can check it, unbiased uh, weighted covariance uh, estimation. It just, uh, instead of having this uh, sum over k of dk dividing, it's, uh, it just changes a term. Uh, but basically, this is a, the, the, the solution that you get when you have a normal uh, distribution uh, policy. But what happens here? And now I will make a question to the, to the audience. So basically, imagine that you have uh, the robot that I showed before that is moving in the Cartesian space, so basically six degrees of freedom. And uh, we have around 20 kernels per degree of freedom. So this adds up to 120 parameters. Thing is that, um, Imagine we want to do a policy update after 20 samples. Mm -hmm. So basically, uh, what will be, so if you answer, if someone knows uh, and can answer uh, through the chat, what will be the dimension of this sigma omega and what will be its rank? So if you can answer in the chat, if you know, you know it. I will give one minute. No answers. So omega has a dimension of 120 in this case. So the dimension of this sigma omega will be 120 times 120. Um, the thing is, what will be its rank if we have only 20 samples for feeding it? No, okay, I will answer myself. Uh, thing is that these guys here, this omega k minus mu omega times uh, omega k minus mu omega transpose, this is a, a column vector times a row vector. So it's basically a rank one matrix. And we are adding up 20 rank one matrices. So basically the outcome will never be more than rank 20 because we are adding rank one matrices. Uh, 20 times. So basically, the rank of sigma double uh, sigma omega is uh, at most 20, and this is a problem because uh, we are uh, we want to optimize to optimize in a search space that has dimension 120, but but the the, the dimension of the of our sigma is then is 20. So basically, there's 100 dimensions in which we are not exploring and we will probably never explore. So this is a problem uh, that I will talk about in a few in a few moments. So adding up, uh, so I'll put this uh, slide back. Uh, so we have demonstrate, uh, we have uh, motion characterization, we parameterize the, the motion, we generate samples from this parameter distribution, we optimize it, 
and then we uh, we well, generate more samples, we optimize again, etc. Uh, so the thing is, uh, what happens, for example, if uh, well, there's a lot of things that can happen. And one of them is that we have a problem that has uh, more than one solution. So imagine in the throwing example that I was uh, telling you about, imagine we have two garbage bins. So now the problem has two solutions. So basically it's a multimodal problem. And in, imagine also this uh, toy example in which you have uh, two uh, parameters, the uh, vertical axis and the, the horizontal axis. And you can see the reward function uh, as, uh, uh, as plotted in, in, in course here. So uh, there are three areas which are like uh, good values, which are yellow, so three optimal solutions or suboptimal solutions and one bad uh, region in the middle. Uh, we generate these samples from, from any initial guess. And so uh, what the relative, uh, the VEPS uh, problem would, would do in this case is just to like do this uh, weighted uh, mean and covariance uh, by uh, applying uh, a weight to each set of, uh, of, to each sample of parameters. And what happens is that actually the mean is very close to a bad region. So it is averaging between uh, good solutions. So it's not uh, a behavior that we want. And if we have this situation also, it happens, similar thing happens. So what can be done in this situation when we have multiple uh, multimodal problems, which and it's something that you have to uh, identify because it's possibly that it can happen <clears throat> and might um, affect uh, severely the performance of your learning algorithms. <clears throat> One solution, uh, that was uh, presented by Daniel et al. was to uh, build a hierarchical method uh, in which um, you have some uh, option variables. And so uh, you can generate new, uh, new uh, solutions based on a threshold parameter kappa. And so depending on this parameter kappa, you are more greedy or less greedy in creating uh, new solutions. Also, uh, what, what we did here also was to not all, uh, use the, the, this uh, REPS algorithm and and add some like two restrictions to those equations, those horrible equations that I just showed you. Uh, so basically, uh, here uh, what we would do is uh, to um, <clears throat> to optimize the policy. So maxim the first row is maximizing the expected reward, subject to that we don't want the new policy to be very far away from the current policy. And also that the policy is a probability distribution, but we had two new restrictions. One of them is that we, the idea is that we cluster the data into several cl clusters and it, this related, these clusters are related to the reward function. And within these clusters, then uh, we check which one are good uh, which one are bad uh, in terms of the world. And so we say, okay, I want to be uh, away from the low performing clusters. Basically, uh, this minimum pullback library divergence between the new policy and the bad clusters. But we want to get close to <clears throat> at least one good cluster, which is this pullback library divergence between policy and the good cluster. What this, uh, what this does is that we are actually using uh, low performance uh, samples because it is very common in these uh, data reweighting uh, methods that when you um, have a sample that has very low reward, this is just ignored. So they, you don't use that information because it's bad. So basically you don't use it because it has a very low uh, weight. So it has zero weight. So here, if we have like bad uh, sample, we push away from it. So at least you use it somehow. And you can, so the equations here become like even more horrible, but uh, I, just, I will just not talk about it. And the thing is that, so let's go back to this situation in which we were. So now we, we generate uh, these clusters depending on, of course, of the distance in the parameter space, but also the reward. And then uh, with, this, with the clusters, we also generate uh, so uh, Gaussian distributions that are like the green ones are like attractive nodes, attractive distributions, and the red one are repulsive. So basically, uh, we bias a little bit the solution 
uh, with respect to what we had. And so uh, comparing, so here we compare the how this is uh, applied on uh, this dual reps versus standard uh, relative entry policy search. As you can see, um, the evolution of this uh, method is uh, faster than the standard reps that actually gets stuck between two solutions. But so what is the take home message uh, here is that you have to be careful in your, uh, you know, what is your uh, problem that you're trying to solve and how many solutions might it have? Because uh, depending on what you're trying to solve, uh, you will want to use one method or another that can consider these kind of situations. Okay, now, uh, I will talk a little bit about another problem, which is dimensionality reduction. So I was talking already about a uh, learning motion with a limited amount of data. I was uh, telling, uh, talking about this guy, the covariance matrix of the normal policy that we had, and that its, um, its rank was up to uh, at most 20, while its dimension was 120. So basically, if you would look at its singular values, it would be like, uh, or writing values, it would be like 100 zeros and then 20 values at most, because uh, there might be, uh, depending on the tolerance that you get for like, uh, singular values. Uh, so basically, if you want to uh, optimize in these search spaces, you either need more uh, samples or you need an, a smaller dimension to work on. So uh, in this case, I'll talk about smaller dimension uh, because uh, we, in, I assume that we cannot have more samples because we are working with real robots. So uh, the idea is that, okay, we can have more samples, so we have to use the dimension. And uh, we'll talk about uh, finding coordination and synergies, uh, both in dynamic movement primitives and probabilistic movement primitives. And the idea here is that uh, just like uh, human do, humans do, uh, when we learn a task, uh, basically, we are not uh, controlling all of our um, muscles independently. So instead, what uh, our brain is doing is uh, learning for each task uh, a synergy pattern of our actuators in order to uh, successfully perform this task. And through experience, we learn to and improve this uh, synergy pattern. So like when playing tennis, you learn few synergy patterns like for, uh, for, for several um, ways of, um, of hitting the ball. And you store that in your mind and whenever you need to play tennis again, you remember those synergy patterns that you have learned through experience and even refine them further. So the idea is to do similar thing with the robots so that we reduce the dimensionality. And this is a little bit like, okay, so we have the robot degrees of freedom that are D, uh, dimension D, and we project it in this case linearly to a virtual degrees of freedom, which are dimension, dimension R. And um, <clears throat> for example, for the probabilistic movement primitives, um, you can you have like the state is approx uh, approximated by the kernel, kernel functions times this omega vector. And so when you map it uh, to a latent space, uh, you have the you have this x, uh, the latent space uh, would be uh, projected upwards by this omega matrix, which is d times r. Pretty simple. So uh, also the probability distribution of, uh, so the distribution of the state y at time t com becomes from this on the left, becomes this on the right. So omega appears a little bit everywhere. But um, uh, the thing is that how to, okay, then how to, uh, get this omega, etc. So we did the, an expectation maximization approach, uh, which basically uh, you can uh, you can check this uh, kind of a statistical inference uh, uh, methods. In I suggest you would read um, Bishop's book uh, if you're interested. I will write it on the chat. So basically this reference um, is a very good reference for uh, statistical and machine learning and uh, for statistical, statistical treatment of variables and machine learning. And uh, so all these uh, kind of uh, methods uh, um, 
detailed. So basically, um, expectation maximization step, you it has two steps. Uh, it has the expectation step where you build a posterior distribution of the omega given the samples that you have, and you maximize the log likelihood of this, um, what's called the complete log, uh, log likelihood, complete data. So basically, you find an analytical solution for these uh, terms, depending on uh, the samples that you have and, and so on. So basically, you can obtain this omega. And uh, one application of this was, would be like these are <clears throat> in this plot I'm showing. Uh, you probably know the now robot, which is a small humanoid robot. So this is data uh, from a walking uh, behavior of the now robot, which is 12 joints, including both legs and hips. Uh, these 12 joints, there's two of them that are mechanically uh, related. So it's really 11 degrees of freedom. But the thing is that, so it's a cyclic uh, movement. That's why that's, that's why all the joints start and end at the same position because it's a cyc cyclic movement. But the idea is that we go from 11, uh, from 11 uh, dimensions to just, uh, I think it was two or three in this case. So basically we reduce the dimensionality a lot. And then if we want to reproduce this, uh, this behavior, we don't need uh, that many parameters to reproduce it. So basically we are more efficient in coding it, but then we can also learn uh, in these kind of uh, situations and the performance in learning. Um, so the performance in learning is, uh, is not uh, uh, affected and actually, is sometimes better because we are not losing time uh, searching in a, in a space that is too large. So uh, here, or using reps, we can update the prompt weights and covariance and find a new latent space projection matrix. Here are some plots of results where uh, the pink one can uh, outperform the other methods. And uh, <clears throat> moving on, we have uh, all, we can also apply this kind of methods to. Uh, dynamic movement primitive. So uh, in this case, uh, for example, we use uh, principal component analysis. Uh, hope that you all uh, know about principal component analysis. Um, it's uh, it's basically uh, you look uh, at the data and you see what uh, linear directions or so eigenvalues and eigenvectors of the data are important, and you can uh, re remove uh, components that are not important. So basically, <clears throat> you can, uh, can use PCA for uh, obtaining this projection matrix and uh, then do a similar, a similar approach. And uh, in this case, we would um, fit the excitation function f of x as a, way, as a product of this kernel functions times the weight but we are without this coordination matrix here. <clears throat> so now uh, this, the learning would work uh, like we would have the current policy, which is this omega, the mu and the sigma of the parameters. Then we sample the trajectories again, and we get this, uh, this shaping, fun uh, shaping function on the, the MP. And then we execute the robot, we get the rewards, then we update the policy, and we start over again. This is how uh, we have the robot learning uh, motion and improving with this uh, latent space projection. But uh, we can still do more. So for example, how do we choose the dimension of this matrix? So I was, uh, I was saying, okay, this matrix is D times R, where R is uh, smaller than D, but how do we get this R? So one way of doing it is iteratively. So basically, you get some samples, uh, some, some samples, some trajectory samples, and then uh, you convert these uh, samples and reward to, to, to weight. So with, for example, um, for, with the policy search method, with, for example, relative entropy policy search. And uh, then you update these uh, parameters and you use PC principal component analysis with those weights that I got from um, the policy search method and the, shape, uh, the shaping function F uh, of, the, of its trajectory, and then I check uh, the singular values uh, of the data. And if these singular values of the data f uh, uh, verify like certain restrictions, like the, okay, so the um, the last component of the principal component analysis is like 
irrelevant with uh, with respect to the other components and i can eliminate so basically we eliminate one column of this omega matrix and then we update this omega <laughs> and then we need to readapt the mean and covariance but uh, this can be easily done and also we can have uh, more than one uh, of, of these matrices uh, which is like having multiple coordination matrix matrix matrices so basically uh, we can have um, an activation coefficient for the three matrices say and we have this transition area which is just the complicated part but uh, we can see that the actually the linear interpolation between them then with uh, with the activation matrix actually gives us a good result and so um we can obtain each one of these uh of these omega matrices with pca in the in the corresponding uh, in the data corresponding to that part in which it is activated okay so now i'll show uh, so uh i'll show more videos now and one of them is an experiment that we did here uh, about uh, folding clothes. Uh, so basically we had two arms and we wanted to fold a polo shirt with these two arms. We were using Cartesian space. Uh, so we were learning Cartesian space. So the state was uh, was of dimension 12 uh, because uh, X, Y, Z and orientation of each one of the two arms. Uh, we, uh, we analyzed how to place the two arms given the uh, restriction that we had to mount them on, like on table or on a, on a fixed support and we used uh, this fit forward controller that, that i talked about uh, to to have a compliant behavior and not like stretch too much the clothing or so we used the, the dynamic movement primitive approach with um, geologic and policy search and we also uh, use this uh, iteratively redu reducing the dimensionality of the problem and uh, also we use these uh, several uh, coordination matrices so as a reward function we were checking with this camera on the on the top we were checking how squared was the solution and how many how wrinkled was it also so basically uh let me play the video so i will Okay. Okay. So first, uh, first things first. So we have to teach a little bit the robot. So basically, we were uh, some of, our, uh, of us in, in the lab were checking who was the best one uh, folding clothes. Yeah, he was not. Uh, and then uh, um, I taught the robot motion. Then we set the variance manually. I will show you this uh, result curve later. But basically, we check these three methods, the standard dynamic and primitive representation and relative entropy policy search. So basically, after some policy updates, what happens is that um, it was struggling a lot uh, during the first updates to get a good result because uh, the search space was too big. We we're talking about yeah, hundreds of, a couple of hundreds per meter. So if we were reducing the dimensionality iteratively, we have uh, we had a better a better learning so it's still not so not perfect because uh, the, the, the problem itself is really hard to, to, to solve well in this in this situation but using also uh, several coordination matrices we had uh, an even better result <clears throat> so here's the, the the learning curves that we obtained so the policy updates on the x side and the reward on the on the y axis so basically the standard methodology you see the red line that is struggling uh, to improve on the early updates because uh, search space is just too large it cannot find there in other it cannot focus on one direction to explore because there, there's too many and uh, if we iteratively reduce the dimension then we get a uh, faster convergence uh, so better behavior here you can also see a uh, uh, an example of the couplings uh, of the, that were generated of the robot because the couplings were uh, here the, these matrices were uh, dimension 12 times uh, 12 at the beginning and then they were reducing mm -hmm. so basically uh, this was about doing the linear dimensionality reduction but we can also do other kinds of dimensionality reduction one of them is uh, by exploiting a little bit the geometry of the problem so there are many 
tasks that you can think about that are uh, intrinsically symmetric. Let's say uh, you're folding some clothes. You can see that uh, there's some symmetry between the two arms. So uh, what we did here was that um, we were um, so we were uh, finding a symmetry plane between the two robots, and one of the robots would act as a master, and the other would be the slave, and and the slave would be uh, would have a reflected uh, motion from the master master arm. So basically, here. Uh, you see that um, we have this pro and P1, which is the master uh, probabilistic movement primitive, which is the characterization that we use. We generate samples from there, and we generate trajectory tau one. We symmetrize with uh, with a symmetry symmetry surface given the like the parameters rho, and we obtain the trajectory two. So these two trajectories were sent to the two arms were execute, uh, execu executed and evaluated. So we obtained the reward. And then uh, after several executions, we would uh, use uh, relative entropy policy search to update these parameters. And this, uh, uh, this proved to be very efficient in learning too. And moreover, so these are, there's like even uh, more complicated uh, ways of doing uh, this dimensionality reduction technique. One of them is Gaussian process latent variable models. And this is a little bit, um, let's say, complex or difficult to understand at first, but uh, you can, if you are interested in the topic, then look for it. There's, uh, there are uh, really great uh, Python uh, libraries of it, and it's very efficient. So basically, uh, Gaussian process latent variable models are based on Gaussian process, uh, which probably many of you probably know. Uh, but our uh, Gaussian processes are functionals that um, that that can represent data uh, with a mean and a covariance that is given by a kernel matrix. And Gaussian process, processes have the advantage that they keep a lot of the of the information from data, but also that uh, if you want to um, to use them, then uh, this kernel matrices K, which is a function of two variables, uh, grows uh, with, uh, with the number of samples that you get. So the more samples that you have, the larger this matrix is. So if you, uh, then there are some inverses there and if you don't want to invert uh, large matrices. So uh, Gaussian processes is a little bit limited by uh, the size of the problem. So basically, if you have very large problems, just use neural networks. Uh, if you have smaller problems, Gaussian process is probably the way to go. And so let me may, uh, let me tell you how this Gaussian process latent variable models come from. So I already talked about principal component analysis. So basically, you have the uh, state uh, state y, uh, and and this i represents the i uh, data point, and this is uh, the projection matrix, linear projection matrix omega times the latent space uh, value x for the sample number a, uh, number i, and all the dimensions, of course, uh, plus some noise. Now, there's uh, the variant of principal component analysis that is probabilistic principal component analysis. And uh, here we said that uh, epsilon is a normal uh, with a sigma squared uh, uh, noise. And then this x value here, we uh, impose that is uh, normal zero one. So uh, while in the principal component analysis, the omega matrix has like all normal vectors, which because it comes from the similar value composition, here the omega matrix, uh, they are the, the columns are not normalized and are not necessarily ortho orthogonal between them. And uh, what we have is that x i are, uh, are normal zero one. But uh, you can then uh, have the probability of uh, the data, of all the data given the latent variables x and omega written like this. And then you can integrate over the latent variables. Uh, so you do the integral over x of the this equation here, you do the integral over x, and then you end up with this uh, likelihood function, which is uh, probability of the data given the um, the latent space projection is this guy here, and then you maximize this like likelihood, and then you obtain the latent space projection matrix omega.
Okay, so, so far, not very difficult. But then there is this thing called the dual probabilistic principal component analysis, which is very long name, but what is what it is done here is that um, we are not considering data points, but we are considering the data dimensions. So basically this y uh, two dots comma j is all the values that the samples take uh, in the in the dimension j. So basically the if j equals one is all the values of the first component of the of the samples. And this is equal uh, to the um, to the latent space uh, value variables x times this uh, omega, which is a column of the of a latent space projection. And here, what we assume is that these columns are uh, normals zero one. And so, this using this, uh, we can all now integrate not over the latent variables, but over the latent space projection. So over omega. And we, what we get is this thing here. And this is really interesting because this is this likelihood that we obtain here is like this same as a Gaussian process with a linear kernel. Because in Gaussian processes, you can have several expressions for, for kernels, and one of them is a linear kernel. And this is the expression of a linear kernel. So basically, what uh, what uh, what uh, Gaussian process latent variable models come from is that saying, okay, so if we do this dual probabilistic principal component analysis and we derivate uh, solutions, we end up with the same as Gaussian processes. So why not change the kernel here? And we get a new way of reducing the dimensionality. So this is where Gaussian process latent variable models come from. So basically, um, you change the kernel here and get new, uh, and you optimize the, the, likely, the likelihood. Thing here is that we are not finding the project the projection to a latent space by itself, but rather we are uh, finding the values of the latent space variables that uh, that uh, fit the best with the data that we have. So optimizing directly with the latent space values means that we can refine the dimensionality of the problem much more. So basically, we can reduce the dimensionality a lot uh, by using this method. And by a lot, I talk about maybe it's depending on the case, can be one, two orders of magnitude of dimensions that we re reduce. And this is what uh, the idea that we used uh, in, in a paper uh, in which we would uh, have some uh, trajectories, uh, uh, y, and uh, we uh, so trajectories, and we would uh, use this data. Y would be um, the uh, pro and p weight associated to each uh, trajectory, for example. Then we can weight data. In this case, we weighted data uh, with uh, mutual information between each dimension of the of the data uh, and um, and the rewards. And then we project these. <clears throat> to a latent space x data and when we are in this latent space which is like dimension two three for example and then we can there we can use uh, op uh, other uh, other optimization techniques like uh, bayesian optimization uh, which is very uh, very efficient for low dimensional uh, for low dimensional problems and for larger dimensional problems, it can be more tricky to apply. But I recommend you if you're interested in, in, if you're interested to learn about uh, Bayesian optimization. So basically, we use Bayesian optimization to um, uh, generate new samples that are meaningful for the problem. And uh, basically, we generate samples in this latent space of uh, latent space with very low dimension. We uh, then project them uh, to the uh, to the full state. And then we evaluated them there, and from here we uh, updated the model with, with new rewards. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, sorry. So basically, there are different ways of reducing the dimensionality of the problem, but uh, as I mentioned, there's uh, many others, and so um, uh, just uh, you can just uh, look for 
for uh, dimensional reduction and robotics. Uh, and you can see uh, other approaches too. Uh, but now we'll talk about another very important topic, which is uh, the adaptability of motion. So basically, I was uh, talking about this garbage uh, bin, uh, throwing paper to the garbage bin. Um, well, uh, it could be like that uh, the road was learning to, to do it. You can put like two garbage bins, but then the garbage bin can move, uh, or we are feeding someone and the person moves. So uh, in that situation, the robot needs to adapt to, to these changes. And in the video I'm going to show also, uh, so basically, uh, we, have, we want to have a robot playing games on this board. And so basically the robot needs to be picking uh, these tokens and placing them in other positions. So it was not feasible to uh, learn all the motions uh, of all the possible combinations and from one point to another. So basically what we are learning, we're uh, learning certain like uh, motions uh, and then interpolating. <laughs> Still was a little bit tedious, but interpolating uh, between these um, positions and and so we, we, uh, with that we could like generate new motions uh, basically uh, this is done uh, this can the, this can be also another case uh, of adaptive of where we need to, to adapt uh, motion so basically we are teaching a robot to feed the mannequin and so uh, we have two types of food and they are all changing their position as well as the, the mannequin so basically, we have uh, X and Y of, of the two plates and the mannequin. So that's six dimensions of uh, of uh, context variables that we can evaluate. Plus, uh, the, 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 the what food we want to do, to to give the mannequin. So basically, this is uh, this would create a context variable that would be seven dimensional in this case. Uh, and other cases where we want uh, the robot to be adaptable is uh, in this case, for example, where we're feeding and using vision to see if the mouth is open or not, just kind of a flag for, okay, we can go in, go in or not, and also adapt to the position of the mouth. Um, <clears throat> and so there's uh, some tools to uh, adapt to changing situation. Again, there's, uh, there's a variety of people working in this kind of topic. So if you're interested, I, I also uh, recommend you to look for it because there's uh, many uh, approaches to these problems. I will just put a, a couple of them that just to raise awareness of uh, how important this is. This is. Um, there's this uh, contextual relative entropy policy search, which is an adaptation of relative entropy policy search, which uh, includes uh, these context variables S and uh, and and so, and other approaches also uh, modulate these uh, problem, problem parameters or movement primitive movement primitive parameters with this parameter s, which we can reduce to condition them, the condition the movement primitive. And uh, also, uh, what we did uh, here was also to combine dimensionality reduction with multimodal policies and these context variables. So basically. We were using this x uh, variable, which would be a concatenation of the context variables, and this new, which would be <coughs> uh, latent variable of the pro MP weights. So this omega that we are seeing all the time, which we put projected to a latent space uh, and get this new. So using this, uh, this is the Gaussian mixture model. So basically, as a weighted sum by this. I K, which is probably, is probably an unfortunate uh, variable name in this in this situation, but but uh, but uh, we'll go on here to cover this. Um, so basically, a, a Gaussian mixture model is a weighted sum of uh, Gaussian distributions. So basically, we have different actions in a in a data set, and each action represents uh, uh, one normal distribution that we can learn these and and condition them on this. Uh, context variable s. So, so basically uh, here we would have our data set and we would um, get these uh, parameter vectors. We would use these uh, dimensional, dimensional reduction reduction techniques to project them to a latent space. And here we would use uh, clustering methods <coughs> uh, or, or other to like to see how many actions there are in our data set. In, the, in our case, we used 
one called persistent homology, which is a computational topology tool. Uh, we will find the number of actions in the fake set, and then uh, with, uh, with knowing the number of fake of actions and having these new value values of the latent space and the contextual features, we will build the Gaussian mixture model. And this Gaussian mixture model will be able to generate new samples and evaluate it, and then uh, update the, the model. As an example application, we, we would uh, use um, hand write, uh, so hand write, handwritten data sets, so uh, several characters. And uh, we, we didn't use all the characters because uh, my computer at the time didn't have enough uh, RAM memory for all of them. But um, we would uh, use these. Uh, so in red, you can see the data that we used, and we fit uh all the characters and then reproduced and generated uh characters within this distribution so they don't match the the original trajectories but are uh but are like very similar and this is by conditioning so the context variable here would be a, an integer value between 1 and 12. <clears throat> so one would correspond to a two to b three to c etc until uh up to 12 which would be the l uh, I think here is that uh, so there's some more to this uh, because uh, we are using an integer value. But what if we send like 1.7? Then um, it would take a b and deform it a little bit towards the a and so on. Depends also in some regularizations and decisions you have to take when uh, fitting this model. Uh, again, there's also some inverse matrix uh, matrices uh, here and. You can see that it worked uh, well, and we used this also in the feeding uh, feeding task that I just showed you. So basically, uh, the context variable was seven dimensional. So we have the head position, the two plates position. We used QR, QR codes here, just not to be too much too complicated in the in the position of the plates, just to uh, go straight to the point, and. Um, Basically, what we did here was to like record all the data. And as you can see, the motion of the end effector, so the motion of the spoon is different from the motion of the fork. So the spoon motion is different from pinching. So basically, uh, the method was capable of uh, distinguishing between, uh, between these two types of, uh, of motion. And using this persistent homology, we could see how this, um, sorry, it went too fast see here that we have really two components, two actions here. So basically, mm -hmm. uh, these methods allowed then to give a new, so uh, given a, a new trajectory, uh, so we can infer, the con so also we, if we give an, a new trajectory, we can infer the contextual situation leading to that motion. So we could infer more or less, so where was, which was the task, where were the plates, uh, particularly the one being uh, being uh, being used, and where was the head? And also, this model could be improved through the report model learning. And given a user refer reference, we can see the position of the plates and head uh, with vision, and obtaining a moving primitive uh, or a p conditioned to that situation, and execute the motion sample. Mm -hmm. So here, oh sorry. So here we have some examples here. Mm -hmm. Okay. And now I uh, talked a little bit about adaptability, but uh, I think there's more to it. So. Again, if you want to, uh, if you want to ask me some references, I could uh, look for references that fit your interest. Your interests. Feel free to uh, contact me by email. But uh, I want to talk also about uh, control. So basically, um, when one of the things that we have to consider when we are controlling a robot is uh, that uh, we are learning a trajectory of motion in the Cartesian space. So basically, any type of pose. There, um, there's a problem with orientation because one thing is to learn a motion and orientate and the orientation profile, and another thing, so you imitate, fit a model, and another thing is to um, 
explore in that model. So basically, if you don't have a minimal representation of the orientation, when you uh, perturbate the values of the orientation, then the restrictions that are uh, that, that you have on the orientation representation are vulnerary. Are, are vulnerated. So uh, you can use other angles, but they have uh, singularities. You can also use uh, rotation matrices, but there are nine values uh, for rotation matrix. So uh, of, the, of the three dimensions, and and so. And they are too redundant, we cannot explore the nine values. Also, you can use quaternions, but uh, quaternions, uh, which would seem to be the most robust representation, but still they have a, a, this uh, problem of like having one restriction. So one thing that can be done with quaternions is uh, knowing that uh, quaternions are, are kind of a double covering of a sphere, uh, with like for, for except for one point for each two covering, uh, covering if you make sure that you not you do not uh, go to that to that point, you do, do not get close to that point, and um, you do not change the the, the sign of the quaternion, then you can project this quaternion to a three dimensional uh, manifold and uh, more or less uh, uh, get away with it. Uh, another approach uh, that is uh, being used by some people uh, lately is uh, using Riemannian manifolds. Uh, so basically using uh, the space of SPD symmetric positive definite matrices for characterizing, uh, characterizing uh, orientation. Uh, this is a little bit complex from the mathematical perspective, uh, but uh, it's, it works pretty well. <clears throat> but uh, this is something you have to consider if you want to learn motion and you want to use um, orientation, then it's something you have to consider. And uh, also uh, combining control and uh, methods like dimensionality reduction. Um, here, I will hmm, let me do something. I will share a video, share a video with you now. Okay. Okay, so one thing that we did for uh, last iGraph was to um, combine uh, these compliant controllers with uh, Cartesian, uh, Cartesian, so Cartesian control, uh, this, um, <coughs> this uh, compliancy, also uh, the, 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 the probabilistic, with probabilistic movement primitives. And we wanted to do, what we wanted to do was to uh, match the uh, motion variance with the, with the controller gains and keep the controller uh, compliant while uh, matching the variance of the of the trajectory that we want to use and uh, also using dimensionality reduction techniques so basically basically uh, here is the control scheme that we that we used so basically a pd controller is sending uh, this um, this uh, force requirement to the robot and then this is uh, multiplied by the Jacobian transport and com converted to a um, to a joint uh, torque then we compensated just gravity in this case and sent the torque to the one robot and then we uh, we uh, sent the, the feedback so this was okay for uh, tracking trajectories for example but um one thing that we could consider here is that uh, so the robot has uh, seven seven joints, so seven degrees of freedom, and the Cartesian space is six dimensional. So basically, there is one free degree of freedom. That free degree of freedom is the elbow. So if you take your hand and, and grasp something that is uh, rigid, you see that you can actually still move the elbow. That is your redundant degree of freedom of your arm. And the thing is that if we don't control it, uh, as in the upper video here, uh, you see that the, the, the elbow is mostly uh, free. But you can, uh, for example, put restrictions by, uh, by using the null space projection and, and see that, okay, I want the, the, the elbow to be close to this position. So basically, you see up in the upper side that the elbow uh, is moving freely, and in the lower side, with this uh, kernel projection, you. you it is more restricted. Mm -hmm. 
And then we explored different ways of controlling the impedance or gains of the robot. One of them is in the trajectory directions. So basically, um, if we <coughs> if we build the the, the, the controller game with a snag in the composition, then we would uh, use uh, this um, this vector. So basically. Uh, we would uh, set a stiff uh, gain on the direction in which the robot is moving and then put a, a very compliant behavior on the perpendicular plane. So basically the robot is going towards the goal, but uh, you can still move it to the sides and it will not be very rigid. So here you see the stiff direction it is on the left on the left you can see on the on the compliant plane perpendicular to the motion, you can move it a lot, but on the direction of motion, you cannot. Also, you can set surfaces of, um, you can set um, surfaces that restrict the motion and, and you increase the gains of, uh, of these uh, matrix that you build according to these uh, directions. Or you can use uh, what was what I was talking about. Uh, you can use the variance coming from a movement primitive. And for example, here we have uh, some motions that we taught to the robot, and you can see that in the uh, in the beginning and in the end, the, uh, the the robot is very precise. So there is a there is few variance. Uh, so we want the robot to be uh, rigid in the, in the early and final stages of the motion, but it can be. Uh, more compliant during the in the midterm. So basically, the robot becomes more compliant and more rigid in the end. <clears throat> and then we can build uh, by using uh, this dimensionality reduction technique that I was talking about. Uh, so basically. Um, finding synergy patterns of the associated to a task. What happens is that, okay, we have um, seven degrees of freedom in the joint space of the robot or six degrees of freedom in the Cartesian space. Basically, if the task uh, is can be represented with two uh, synergy patterns, then we have four free degrees of freedom that, that we can use for other things, like uh, avoiding obstacles or that we can leave them, for, leave them free. And this is what we did here. So if we are uh, always compliant, for example, here we left uh, the Z component very compliant. So the robot is doing its motion, but we can motivate it while, while it's moving. Or we can use it for, uh, for example, in this case, the Z component, which was not very relevant to the task. We can use it for uh, avoiding obstacles. So basically here you see how it, the robot knowing of course, knowing the position of the of the obstacles, uh, it's capable of avoiding them very easily, just by doing this uh, null space control. So, um, basically, uh, here we can also see the, uh, the kinematic redundancy, the elbow. Okay and the task dependent compliance. So the position of the, of the, of the water glass is very rigid. Now with dimension of the reduction, uh, we can have this task with the degrees of freedom. So uh, now let me share the other screen again. Okay, I think it's okay. It's fine. And um, okay, so this is uh, mostly all. I went through, I think, a lot of things. I went into a little bit of detail in, in some of them, uh, less detail in others. Uh, I think that's uh, a little bit of uh, math is always good, but not too much. And uh, the conclusion is that many, fa many, many factors need to be considered when learning robot motion. Uh, kinematics is important, as I showed you. Control is also important, uh, important 
specifically and more impo most important when we do human robot interaction uh, because say, as I said, safety comes first. You have to be very sure that say, uh, the robots behave safely. And I uh, talked a little bit about representing motion and also improving through experience, uh, also uh, dealing with multimodal problems, uh, sample efficiency, uh, adaptability, etc. And uh, take home message would be to know the, the type, try to, if you want to do robot motion learning, uh, try to read a lot of the literature, uh, read surveys to see what people is doing, what uh, things work and what things do not work. Uh, also try to understand the problem you're trying to solve because it might change uh, the, the outcomes. So maybe you have a multi-model problem and you don't know about it. Maybe you build a reward function that is not um, actually uh, reflecting what you actually want. Um, maybe you have a problem with dimensionality, so know how uh, your problem is going to be. And uh, most of all, and most importantly, have a good matrix inverse code because uh, this is a problem that is, that is very recurrent. And so uh, at some point you will, pro if you haven't find such problem, you will probably uh, go uh, run into this problem uh, at some point and we, you will not know uh, what's happening until, uh, until uh, some uh, like hours after. So thank you very much. Uh, this is all I hope. Uh, you enjoyed this presentation and uh, now if you have any doubts uh, you just uh, unmute the me the micro the micro and ask me or you can ask for uh, your turn in the in the chat thank you thank you Adria, for your presentation mm -hmm. uh, now it's time for question please if any of you have any question now is the moment Okay. Uh, okay. Yes, you have Alberto. a question in the chat. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, projecting and defining solutions in a latent space is suitable for online control. Uh, okay. So, uh, depending on what uh, mapping that you are using, so um, in so in the video that I, that I was showing, um, so the solutions were in the latent space, and we were doing online control because uh, latent space projection was uh, linear. In the case of a Gaussian process latent variable models, um, it can be complicated because uh, you have to like uh, the, the projection from the full state to the lower dimensional state and from back again uh, is not uh, it's not trivial. Uh, for sure, there is a sparse version of this uh, Gaussian process latent variable models that is uh, computationally faster, but you you need to be careful uh, which motion characterization you are you're using so also which uh, dimensionality reduction technique uh, you are using using and uh, the computational capabilities so in in the case uh, of this um, last video that i showed uh on the robot i can remember that this that we had um uh, when doing this uh, singular value decompositions uh where singular value compositions were a little bit uh, tricky and we had to uh, to refine uh, to work on the code so that we could do it online uh, otherwise it was giving us problems so the main enemy of real time is mostly uh, matrix inverses uh, so that's why i added this comment because uh, the real enemy in, in many areas of reinforcement learning and machine learning is uh, matrix inverses mm -hmm. uh, thank you mark Mm -hmm. So, if you have any other uh, question or comment, hmm? okay. Then, if there are no more questions, I think we can close the session. Thank you, everyone.